Morning. Welcome to our program, Struggles of the Spirit. Uh, I'm your host and interviewer, uh, the Reverend Lee Udell, and we're delighted you, you turned into the program today. We're continuing our series of, of looking at ministry, different kinds of ministry, lay ministry or ordained ministry, whether uh, the person involved is a, is a Jew or a rabbi or a priest or a minister, a lay person, uh, no matter what the role, we're, we're examining lay ministry and ordained ministry and looking at differences and similarities. And today we have a, a, a special guest, uh, we have um, Cher Abilidou, uh who is with us, uh, someone that I have known for a number of years. Uh, and uh, uh, we decided, as we talked about the, the program, not to start out uh, cluing you in as to what her vocational uh, uh, work is. Uh, we're going to let it flow, and you will discover about that. But we, we, we decided to do it that way because we, we want to emphasize uh, ministry and what ministry means for her and not to have someone automatically characterize uh, what the, the ministry is uh, because of how she earns her living. Uh, so uh, Sheriff, I welcome you to the program and, and, and I, I guess as I said I, I'd like you to begin uh, talking about what ministry means to you and then to go into chronology how we, when you first were practicing ministry. Thank you, Lee. Um, should I start at the beginning, or should I start at the beginning? <laughs> well, try to try to define ministry as it okay. as you see it now. Okay. Um, well, I think I think I'll do it just the opposite, actually, if you don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> That's um, perfectly okay. When I was a child, uh, my view of ministry. Um, was uh, that of the ordained minister. I think mm -hmm. it was uh, most, mm -hmm. most child's uh, view of ministry. And what I did for God, I did on Sundays while I was at church. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And sometimes when I said my prayers at night, and that was my relationship with God. Um, what, you, what you did at your, at your prayers at the bedside, that's and right. then what you did on Sunday at, at, at church. church. That's correct. Uh, and I didn't think of it as ministry, certainly. It was just where my relationship with God was. Okay. Uh, I didn't extend it beyond that. I didn't extend it into my everyday life. Um, and I sort of went along like that uh, until uh, I was um, in college. Mm -hmm. And at that time, um, I was really into science. Mm -hmm. And um, so that the scientific part of me said, prove it. <laughs> and yep. I stopped believing in God. Um, and for 20 some odd years, I was really quite a happy atheist, uh, <laughs> quite content. You really were. I really was. Okay. I really was. You were, you were. Um, not seeking for anything, um, not uh, um, feeling the need to search or, I was very happy. My view of, of people who believed in God uh, was that they were um, needy people, probably mm -hmm. not very intelligent. It was a very arrogant view. <laughs> <laughs> probably not very intelligent um, and needing a crutch. Um, so I was very happy. Um, so, may, may I ask you a question about, about sure. the happy atheist? Uh -huh. uh, not necessarily just about you, but uh, sometimes, you know, the word atheist is, is a dirty word. and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's helpful for us to look at it not in the, in that sense, but to try to understand it better. Uh, an, an atheist then, then, at least as you understood it, uh, uh, didn't worry about whether anything has an eternal meaning or value or purpose. Everything everything was transient and uh, here and now. And here and now, and uh, the fact that. Uh, at the grave, <laughs> what what is it? Whoever's it might be at the grave, it really had no 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 no, no bearing. Person's dead. That's the end of it. That's the end of Next, it. Next, let's go on. Exactly. 
really. Exactly. Okay. And I, you know, um, well, um, I can look back in a minute, but then um, I threw uh, a patient of mine. Mm -hmm. Oops, I just divulged what That's I... That's all right. Sooner or later you were going to say something. <laughs> I had a nurse practitioner, um, a mm -hmm. pediatric nurse practitioner, and a patient of mine um, was a vehicle for my conversion. Um, not in a way that um, I could even tell it was happening, interestingly enough, or maybe it wouldn't have happened, mm. uh, but in the way he l led his life and in, in, uh, through his dying, um, I suddenly found myself um, knocked off my horse, so to speak, mm. and, and not real happy about it. What um, was so special about the, his, the way he was living and, 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 and finally dying? Yeah. What, what, what was it that made um, you, he uh, was a, He was, a, well, sit up and it take goes notice. back to some of my original feelings about uh, people who believed in God. He was a very intelligent young mm -hmm. man. How old was he? Uh, he was 21 when I first met him. Mm -hmm. um, he was deeply religious, uh, but in a way that um, was a lived religious experience. Uh, God was very much part of his life. He talked, uh, you know, about college and dating and um, sports and God all in the same kind of conversation. <laughs> I found it very puzzling because I, uh, we were good friends. I was his caretaker um, and I admired him. He lived with a, a joy that I had never seen before, mm. this immense joy, even as, she, as he was knowing that he was dying. Um, and I would walk in his room and he'd be reading the Bible and I'd, I'd be embarrassed, I think. He's reading the Bible. This doesn't compute, you know. Um, He's a young man. Why but, should he read the Bible? But in my, in my role with him, of course, I, I support whatever someone's um, sure. you supports could be doing are. Origami, origami, you know. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and so I supported him and listened to him when he talked about his God and and. Um, and then in his dying, I found myself extraordinarily angry one night at his God, very angry, and ranted and raved to a good friend. And at the end of it, I thought to myself and said to her, isn't it strange that I can be so angry at a God I don't believe in? And it was sort of like <laughs> a whack. And, and it was like mm -hmm. um, not something that that I had thought about or planned, and in fact, I even said, oh no, there go my Sundays. <laughs> Little did I know. But um, <laughs> so then uh, the things that I had previously attributed to um, people, mm -hmm. I w had this wonder about the goodness of people mm -hmm. and the, the ability of people to love and, and the um, uh, well, just the goodness that's mm. inherent in people that I had always seen, even as an atheist, um, my sense of what the source was uh, changed. Okay. And uh, so... It wasn't um, just the quality of their personality. It was exactly. something more. Exactly. And I found <clears throat> myself uh, bringing uh, my patients in prayer to God, and, and I would say to God, oh, this this child is really hurting, or this family is in such pain, or um, please God, be present with this family. Let them feel your arms around them. Let them feel your love. It will make all the difference in their life. How did, how did you move from being so angry with God about his death to asking God? I didn't do any prayer? of it. Um, God did it all, and I and I was a, a somewhat unwilling participant. And then it was it was I was so encompassed by uh, the absolute unconditional love of God that uh, it wasn't a choice. It was um, mm -hmm. it was it overwhelmed me. It became my inner core. Um, and I and I remember one time when I was was in prayer. I used. It, it, I would visualize bringing this child or this family to God or having God present because I knew that that, that presence in my life was everything and I knew that what a comfort that would be to these people. And one day God said to me, okay, go ahead. And I sort of went, 
Go ahead. What? I, when, I, when I was saying to God, please be present to these people. Please bring, put your arms around them. Mm -hmm. uh, please let them know how much you love them, that they're safe. Um, God said, go ahead. And I think that's the first um, time I really realized that God was asking me to do something. Uh, before I had such a sense of joy and such a sense of being loved, but um, God was asking me to help him do his work mm. on earth. Uh, and it became uh, my, my practice to, um, to say a prayer before I went into a room knowing that I had something difficult to do, uh, like be with a child who's dying or a family who had just gotten bad news. Um, and I, and I, f I find myself saying, um, I don't begin to know how to do this, God. <laughs> um, give me the words yeah. that will comfort. You know, I'm sure that you've done this too. I know what you mean. Many times. And somehow, when I went in the room, the right words came out, the right <clears throat> actions, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I cease to worry about it. Um, were you yet beginning to realize you had a, a ministry? Yes, that's when it that's when it started. When God said, "Go ahead, go ahead, go do it." Um, but you, what you, what you were doing as a nurse before that time, although it was humanitarian, it was exactly the same thing. Only I thought I was doing it. Ah, uh, okay. You see. Okay. Um, you want to say a little more about that? Uh, it it. I was doing the same job. I was very present. Certainly, I was very present to this young man. Um, this young man's mother said that it, that it was interesting because uh, this person never knew that I was an atheist because they just could see God acting through me, <laughs> um, and that was startling to me. But but um, I was very supportive of my patients. I was very loving with them. Um, I tried to help them use whatever their supports were. I tried to get them the the uh, um, extra support that they needed or to help them utilize in whatever way mm -hmm. the people that were around them or uh, their, sense, their strengths. Um, I was doing that uh, and I, I think that I believe that God um, uses us uh, even when we're unaware and even now uh, when I'm much more aware that God uses me when I when I can't even begin and one of my everyday prayers is um, God let me be a vehicle for you today mm -hmm. in whatever way you mm -hmm. choose mm -hmm. and I don't have to know about it just just mm -hmm. use me and let me say yes mm -hmm. because sometimes God asks me to do things that I'd say um, Oh, do I have to do this? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> you know. Sure. Uh, well, Moses didn't like what God had in mind for him to right. do. You know, he yeah. said, "Can I just stay here and look after the sheep?" It's right. kind of a nice, quiet right. life. Right. So I, I sense that um, ministry. Um, I, I do more. Um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, defined ministry. Mm -hmm. I do what most people think is ministry. I'm a Eucharistic minister. I'm a lector. Um, but uh, I don't see that that is any more ministry, and maybe not as much ministry. But I know I would say not any more ministry than, than the rest of my life. Um, I think that uh, God calls us to ministry in our families, in our marriages, as parents, as friends. Um, and what we do for work, I've had people say to me, well, uh, that's easy for you because you work with people and you work with children that may be dying or children that are critically ill. Um, you work with fearful people or people in crisis, but I work with a computer or I work with a typewriter. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do I do ministry? Uh, and yet, I see people who do ministry when they're doing these jobs uh, in the way they treat their co-workers, in the way they're present to people, in the way they do the job as uh, honestly and thoroughly as they do, um, in the way they let people out into traffic as they go down Route 7 and someone's been waiting for <laughs> 20 minutes. Flag persons. Right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. <clears throat> So you see it in a very, very broad, broad sense.
Ministry means service, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And to humanity and, and, and when you, well, to humanity, but you have discovered that when you do it consciously in, in the name of God as well, mm -hmm. it makes a difference. Well, it makes a difference for me because it gives me a sense of peace uh, about what I'm doing. And if I get really stressed, um, or very fearful about something that I'm going to do, all I have to do is take a moment and go into prayer and ask for God's help, and, and I feel that sense of peace about what I'm doing. So it certainly um, makes the difference. And it's not just way. Shira and her medical staff working to save children's lives. You, you feel that, that God is involved oh, as well. Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, I feel, um, it's hard to explain, but I feel very much sometimes like a like a hollow vessel mm -hmm, <laughs> well, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that uh, um, God uses. And, uh, you know, um, I have a re reputation uh, in our department for being uh, very good at doing procedures, mm -hmm. doing them very rapidly, doing them uh, with less pain. And uh, with a few people, they've you know they've said to me, "How do you do that?" And I don't tell everyone this, but but I always, as I'm doing a spinal tap or a bone marrow, I always say a prayer um, and ask God to help me. Um, and I don't have the sense at all that I'm particularly good at doing these things. That that it's God helping me so that I don't hurt this child any more than I have to. Um, if, if you were doing a spinal tap mm -hmm. or bone marrow on me, I would be delighted that you were asking God <laughs> yes, for help. Yes, me too. Yes, if uh, on me. I, I'm quite familiar with what those procedures are like. And, yes. Uh, I, I know they can be painful and, and certainly... And very um, frightening. Very frightening. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I do know, uh, I won't mention his name, but I, I do know of a physician who who uh, <clears throat> would, would uh, I think it was, he would say the portion of the Hail Mary before he would do some difficult procedures. That's great. And uh, he, uh, it was interesting, and he, he found that things went better when he did that. Yeah. Uh, I, very few people know that, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I don't think very many people know that uh, but I do that before, before procedures either. But it really <coughs> works. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and I always and I always am mindful that that it's God working and not me. Um. Now, looking at priesthood, then, uh, how going going back to uh, your your days when you were a child and, mm -hmm. and you you saw the priest as doing being the minister. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you look at a priest today in terms of ministry, vis-a-vis uh, -vis lay ministry, mm -hmm. your kind of ministry? Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I'm going to quote someone who we, we were just talking about this last week, actually, and one of the priests that I uh, am good friends with um, him for, said that he viewed, uh, he had come to view his ministry as ministering to the laity so they could then go forth mm. and minister. And I thought that was a wonderful uh, description of, of exactly what they do in so many ways. Um, but I think we're partners in ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And uh, we, we, do, we do some of the same things, we do some, of the, some different things. Um, and I don't think, I would hate to see a time when we didn't have ordained ministers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important. I, um, I think we're all called in different ways to do God's work. So you, you're not seeing it as a, they're a real minister vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, what, what is a lay, lay minister? No, that's not the way I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, but I wanted to <laughs> underline that uh, yes. for our, our viewers that uh, because sometimes people don't. That's not to put down ordained ministers no, in any way. It. Yes. I yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in the in for those of our viewers who are who are not uh, 
in, in the Christian uh, context, uh, when a Christian is, is baptized, uh, at least uh, I'm an Episcopalian in, in our tradition and also in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, uh, you or your, your godparents and parents who are standing in for you if you're an infant, uh, uh, there's a promise to, uh, to, to really to be a minister. Uh, it's not the word minister isn't there, but uh, uh, the, the work of the minister is, 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 is stated in every baptism yes. so that you don't wait to be ordained a, a priest before you're made a minister. You're, when you become a Christian at baptism, you, you become a, a minister. God's yeah. priestly people. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are many different terms for this approach uh, to ministry. Sometimes it's called mutual ministry. That's mm -hmm. the in word I, I, I understand these mm -hmm. days. Um, but it, it's a ministry we all share with the uh, with the ordained ministry, and. Uh, well, when you think about uh, the way I used to think about ministry as being just for the ordained, what a lot of uh, burden to put on single individuals. How could they possibly right. be everywhere? Yeah, uh, they can't. <laughs> it's they impossible. An, you know, they have a hard enough job to do with the ministry that they do, and it's a very difficult job, but to be everywhere, to be there and in the world and... Um, at the bedside and, um, you mm -hmm. know, at the birth and at the death and how could any human being do that? And, w and it makes sense that God would ask us all to do his work. Yeah, I, I remember I, <coughs> having been a, a, a chaplain uh, in hospitals all my life, uh, I remember it's some years ago at the, at the Fletcher Allen, uh, I was talking w with a Roman Catholic priest, and uh, we we had a patient in common, and and uh, I I went to the uh, to the uh, funeral, and then the internment with a priest. He was officiating because the patient was Roman Catholic. And afterwards, I said to him privately, I said, you know, really, the the real work is just beginning, uh, because there's going to be a lot of grief that needs to be dealt with mm -hmm. in this family, especially mm -hmm. in this family. How do you how do you manage it? And uh, he said, Lee, I, I can't. He said, I know you're right. I know they need a lot of work. I, uh, I'm out straight. Mm -hmm. and I think he had, I don't know, up to uh, like a thousand people mm -hmm. in, in his mm -hmm. parish. I mean, I, it, uh, and that's where, where lay people come that's in. That's right. Uh, there's no lack of skills, talents, abilities on, on the part of lay people. And I know like in, in your, your ministry at the hospital, you, you have a, a, a grieving group to help, yes, I do. to help people deal with their grief. In other words, you don't just put IVs in people or, 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 or deal with, uh, with solutions and medications mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and diagnoses, but you also uh, help people with their feelings. That's right. I have a, a bereavement group that meets once a month uh, within Fletcher Allen, and uh, it, it's composed of parents of mm -hmm. children who have died within my practice. And I also follow people <coughs> informally. Not, grieving groups are not for everybody. Not everyone does a group well. So when I have a child die, um, I uh, continue contact with the family for at least a year. Mm -hmm. I contact the family um, on specific dates during the year, the child's birthday, the Those date the child... anniversary dates. Right, the anniversary dates, the date the child was diagnosed, the date the child died. I contact them on special childhood days, like before Christmas, before Thanksgiving, before Halloween, before kids go back to school. These are, these are terrible times for parents who have lost a child. Um, or if I know of special things, I had one patient who really loved the 4th of July. I knew that was going to be a hard time for those parents or that family. Uh, and we talk about things like, um, what will you do this Christmas? Mm -hmm. How will it be the same? How will it be different? Is there some way that you would like to especially 
remember this child or do you need to change your routine? You know, it's different for different people and you have to, um, much of my ministry is just trying to listen really well mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, what is special about those people. I also contact people um, by phone, and this is all done by phone, uh, on special uh, times during the year um, that I think that they may be having more trouble than others, such as right around the three to four month period, that's a hard time for parents and families. Uh, and they continue to have both my work and home numbers. So they know they can reach me if they get into trouble. Um, if they're in major trouble, I would refer. Mm. Uh, I've only had to do that once. Um, and generally, uh, people um, do grieving the way they do living mm -hmm. in the same unique fashion. You mm. know that. And, and you need to support them in, in their unique style. Um, it takes a very long time. It's not quickly over. It doesn't just take a year. Uh, and I will continue to keep in touch with people uh, longer than that. It, we would call that in, in, in theological language, uh, you have a pastoral ministry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Over and above your technological ministry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have a pastoral ministry. And that's, that's great. Um, uh, I have a dear friend, uh, a gynecologist, an obstetrician, who in his practice, uh, particularly as a t in a large teaching hospital in New York City, he would routinely, when he would sit down it, 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 it with his o o OBGYN mm -hmm. patients, he would sit down at their bedside and he would take their pulse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, by touching. By touching. And uh, mm -hmm. there was a young resident who said to him later, why are you doing that? It's all in the chart, for goodness sakes. Mm -hmm. You know, and he said, because <laughs> I want to establish contact with mm -hmm. this person. And mm -hmm. by taking their pulse and sitting down next to them, uh, I'm I, 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 one person with another. I mean, mm -hmm. ultimately, although the residents are doing most of the work, I, I, as a, a teaching physician, I'm I'm in charge of what's going to happen to this mm -hmm. woman, and uh, she needs to have some sense of my presence, my care, my right. my nurture, uh, and I can do that just by taking her pulse. Mm -hmm. People need to be touched. People need someone to not be hurried when they come into your room, and to sit down with them, to let them know that you're there for them, and not just thinking about the next thing that you're doing. Um, yeah, that's uh, so. I guess as as we're talking here, I guess I'm saying that even even doing a uh, a uh, procedure can be a pastoral Absolutely. act if you do it that way, Absolutely. taking a blood pressure, all kinds of things, Absolutely. or palpating. Well, a person's you use body. you you use whatever opportunities you have, don't you? And and sometimes I do it even. Um, I always when I do an intake um, history, that's. Um, a strange word, isn't it? I sometimes <laughs> use language that I hadn't thought through. But when I initially meet someone, I try to um, find out more about them as a family, more about the child, what they're like personality-wise, what their strengths are. Um, and I always ask, um, do you belong to a particular religion? Is that a source of strength for you? Um, is that something you lean on? So that I know um, where they're coming from and I can help them utilize it along with all the other things I learned. Uh, yeah. Um, so your, uh, your ministry is many faceted. Uh, it is. And, but it also goes on, you were saying before our, our, our cameras were turned on, you were saying that you have a ministry in addition uh, outside of uh, the hospital and your work as a nurse practitioner uh, uh, in other ways. Um, do you want to talk about those kinds of ways? And, and because some of them may be more typical of what what uh, what, what our, 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 our viewers uh, have mm -hmm. as opportunities in their own life? Um, well, I have the um, the more acknowledged ministries of Eucharistic minister 
mm -hmm. and lector within within my church. Mm -hmm. uh, but I but I see ministry very broadly. Uh, That's what I want to hear from you. <laughs> Something I, about that. I see ministry as um, taking place wherever I am in my daily life. So that means that I'm in ministry, um, that I may be doing God's work uh, in my, as a wife, mm -hmm. as a mother, as a friend, certainly, um, as a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, or that person going down Route 7 that lets someone in. Yes, that's very you know, appreciated. But don't you know how, how you feel when someone does that for yes, you? Yes, you do. You know, um, that's just, uh, you do. God asks us to love God and love each other, and that's loving each other. Um, in the way that I uh, treat wait waiters <laughs> that yeah. wait on me, or salespeople, mm -hmm. um, The way I the way I live my life in general, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not uh, it's it's that sounds like it's something that I'm doing, and in a sense I am because I'm saying yes, but it's still much more of a sense of being a vehicle, mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. of being um, aware that at this moment God may be asking me to do such and such and doing it, saying okay. Um, sometimes to the very mundane of uh, when I see a, a piece of paper in the corridor, instead of just because I'm busy and I'm running, running by it, picking it up because someone might slip, and I, and I, I think of that as very tiny ways that that mm -hmm. um, I'm in ministry. So I, I may have a broader view of ministry than most people do. I like your view of ministry. Yeah. I think it's it's accurate. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, I, I was thinking of the Good Samaritan parable, uh, but of mm -hmm. course that, that is a form of nursing and, and, and care. Um, but there, I'm sure there are many in the, in the Old Testament and New Testament mm -hmm. that, that are similar. Uh, well, um, the road to Emmaus when they invited him for dinner. Yes. You know, yes. It's just yes. the ministry of hospitality. Uh, yes. Um, I have a, a, a good friend um, who whose family provides me with uh, views of ministry all the time. But there's this wonderful story about um, uh, at Thanksgiving, they always set an extra plate for someone who might be unexpected, for the unexpected visitor. And one uh, day before Thanksgiving uh, meal, there was a knock on the door, and there was a man there, and um, he was clutching his pants. They were very large for him, and he didn't have a belt. Mm -hmm. And he said that um, he was homeless and he was hungry, and, uh, and this man sort of sparkled and, and thought, here's my uninvited guest. And he invited him in. And he realized that he was clutching his pants. And, um, and he had daughters everywhere. And there was a man he really didn't know who was clutching his pants. And he said, you need a belt, and started to take off his belt and give it to him. And his wife said, no, no, not that belt. It was a belt that, that someone very dear to them had just given him. And she ran and got another belt. But indeed, they gave him a belt. They fed him. They gave him a bus ticket. And, uh, and who would have known that day? I mean, if you wake up in the morning and say, well, what ministry am I going to do today? Let's <laughs> plan this. Who would know yeah, when you're going to get that knock at the door yeah, that yeah. defines what God is asking you to do at that moment? Was the man comfortable with the generosity? I think he was, from what I hear. Um, he was grateful and, and went about his way. Um, got a bus uh, ticket. I, when I was, uh, years ago, I was a Boy Scout, and you're supposed to do a good deed every mm -hmm. day. Uh, there's something that annoys me about doing good deeds every day. What, what, could, can you, could you, do you, I don't know if you feel that way. And, and how is, how, if, it, well, what, what is something, why is, why, um, it's so for me to ask you that, what, but why am I annoyed at doing a good deed every day, whereas I, I, I applaud what happened here in your story? Yeah. I think, I think it's the, um, 
the sense of planning. Now I'm going to go do a good deed, and it's I'm going to do yeah, okay. a good deed, That's rather than saying yes in response to what God asks you to do, and recognizing mm -hmm. that you're a vehicle. I, that's what I would guess. I, you know, I, I can tell stories of myself. I, re I remember um, I, I had an experience of doing what I thought was going to be a good deed, and I was I, was, I did a lot of meditating on this after. Um, I was running for the bus at work, and I missed it. And I thought, oh darn, you know, I'm always in such a hurry. And I was running for a bus, and I saw a woman who um, was a housekeeper. Mm. And I recognized her, um, and I thought, oh, I can do a good deed. I can sit and talk with this housekeeper, not realizing how arrogant that really was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sat there, and um, she, she knew my name. And I didn't know hers. Yeah, that's embarrassing. That was, well, it wasn't only embarrassing, but it was very telling as, as it went along. Mm. She knew my name. And not only did she know my name, but she knew quite a lot about me. Mm. I knew she was a housekeeper, and I was doing a good deed. And she t said, you know, I remember when your mother was so sick. Oh, my. She said, I remember what a wonderful, wo and my mother had died uh, like 10 years before. She said, I used to go in and talk with your mother. And she, she knew my mother's name, and she said, you know, talked about how my mother would talk about me. And then she told me that her mother was very ill right now. And um, when my bus finally came, I said goodbye, not, still not knowing her name, which I made sure I found out the next day. And as I thought about it, I, th I was so embarrassed. Yeah. And I was so chagrined at my arrogance. And here, um, here I was seeing God. I mean, I, that was an encounter with God for me. Uh, through her, I mean, that was God saying, I don't think you're so good. Don't think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you weren't acting as a vehicle there. You were doing a good deed. And, yeah, um, yeah. that's, that's, that's yeah. a good example, yeah. I think. Yeah. A very good example. Yeah. yeah. And it backfired yeah. to the actual, in the actual example. Exactly. Yeah. That you, knowing you personally, I, I know you also volunteer in a, in a camp in the summertime. Uh, uh, is, in your work at, in the camp, is that mostly as a nurse, or is it uh, uh, in terms of keeping uh, keeping the routines going and the, and the children not not uh, br breaking the building or? or uh, or well, I, I'm the medical director for the camp, and uh, I oversee okay. their I oversee their um, medications. medications, chemotherapy, okay. any accidents they have. I have uh, a nursing staff that's wonderful, um, and but more than that, um, I that that's one of my larger experiences of God during the year. What happens at camp is just uh, the epitome of of people loving. Mm -hmm very well. Uh, I do a memorial service for children who have died at camp, uh, and that's a beautiful service with the help of, of very good friends that are very talented. Um, and uh, the, the beauty of camp, um, and the reason I see God there so well, is that uh, people quickly lose their walls. It's one of the joys of, of uh, my job in general because people in crisis lose their walls very quickly. So instead of walking down the corridor and having someone say to you, how are you, you know, and mm -hmm. the other person mm -hmm. saying, fine, even mm -hmm. though they may be in the middle of a divorce or someone just died, or um, you don't do that uh, in these situations. In a camp, uh, within hours, and certainly within the first day, people lose their walls. They're very vulnerable. They're very out there. Why and is that so? Um, I, it's one of the things God does. I don't, I don't know. It happens. It happens to adults and children alike. I've had adults who uh, have real trouble. You know, they're going to go there and they're going to do a good deed. Here we go with good deeds again, <laughs> and they find themselves uh, changed. 
forever changed. I have people on st there, there are people on the staff that buy their own. They take their own vacation. They're not paid. Mm -hmm. They buy their own plane tics tickets from Washington and Florida and North Carolina and and California. Really, they come that f from that distance. To volunteer because it's such a beautiful experience of, and I would say of God's presence. Um, they may say of of you can define it uh, any way you want. It's sort of like. Um, when I was an atheist, was was God working through me, or uh, it's it's like it it's just a, a matter of what you call it. If you if you don't call a tree a tree, would it still not give shade? Kind mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. sense, and uh, so people are extraordinarily vulnerable at camp and very loving and very caring of each other. And I've had multiple experiences mm -hmm. of people going above and beyond. Uh, for each other, and including the youngest children, of, of loving extraordinarily well. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I heard about the camp uh, from someone in the Boston area. Uh, oh, really? Uh, I, I mentioned your name to mm -hmm. them. Somehow it didn't ring a bell. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I can't remember who it was that I spoke mm -hmm. with. Was it recently? Yeah, well, I talked with them, yeah, about within the last month. Because we were on national TV. And they wouldn't have recognized my name because I wasn't named on it. But oh, okay. uh, we were in Inside America. Oh, okay. So many people called around the country. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this a unique camp? There are other uh, there are other camps for children with cancer throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. um, some of them very good. Some of them um, kind of like a usual camp. Our campus is, is extraordinarily um, creative. <laughs> uh, we have amazing staff. Uh, I, I'm going to say something. I, I'm not saying it mm -hmm. to embarrass you, mm -hmm. but, but but because somehow I think the Holy Spirit has led me to say it. Um, there are conversations in, in the Episcopal Church as well as in the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and maybe the Orthodox churches uh, that that the, the priest at the at the altar must uh, be male because uh, if if uh, uh, they're supposed to be, the individual is supposed to be an icon of Christ, and Christ was male. Uh, and as I listen, listen to you, Shara, I think you are an icon of Christ, and you're not male at all. I'm not male. Thank you very much. That's about really? the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Well, I really feel uh, that. I really feel that. Thank you. And, uh, uh, and it, it has nothing to do with what is done at the altar. You know, yeah. it has to do with. I mean, if you see an icon of Christ, you see an icon of Christ, and it, and, and it's not necessarily tied up with gender, gender, or, or a certain function. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that, and I think, I think that we will see changes in that thinking over the years. I think it will probably be slow, um, and maybe slow change is good change and less disruptive. I don't know, uh, but that doesn't stop someone from doing God's work because they're female. Um, it doesn't stop you from being uh, one of God's priestly people. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think it's just uh, societal, and it was societal, <laughs> uh, if you right, think about sure. it in the time of Jesus, and that's, that's my belief. It isn't something that makes me extraordinarily angry, because I have such a sense that the Spirit is moving. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. God's own time, um, things happen, uh, and and I absolutely trust um, how God does mm -hmm. things and the timing mm -hmm. that God uses. So, uh, while I have certainly um, listened, while. Uh, other women within my church have experienced pain around this issue um, and can understand their pain. Um, it's not my own personal issue. Well, my, my, I'm glad that doesn't give you a personal unrest. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if, if suddenly uh, your, your church would permit women to be ordained, I, I would personally think, at least for Shara, Bella do, that would be a terrible waste. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I don't, I think, I I don't think feel called ministry, to the ordained ministry. Yeah, well, your ministry yeah. is, is rich okay. and full and valuable and blessed, and uh, I mean, God is active in it, and uh, mm -hmm. what more can anyone ask? <laughs> right. you know? 
And, and that's not to say that in 10 years God not, might not say it's time for you to be ordained. Well, I don't know, but, the, I, but I trust. The future we never know about. <laughs> right. Speaking of the future, it's time now for people to phone in. If you would like to uh, phone in and speak with me or speak with Cheryl Billadu, our, our guest, about our, our subject of, of uh, ministry and lay ministry, uh, um, priestly ministry, if you wish, uh, we welcome your calls. We really enjoy them. We like feedback. We like a dialogue. And we have a speaker phone here. So uh, once we're connected uh, by calling the number on the screen, uh, you can just join us and be a th we can be a threesome here. So uh, please, please call. We have 15 minutes uh, available for you to phone in and to, uh, to join us here at uh, Channel 15. So please, uh, please give us a call. We, we'll continue to talk, but uh, uh, the minute we, we have a clear signal that you are on the line, we will uh, stop our, our conversation and, and talk with you. So please, uh, please call. Um, have you had any uh, of your associates uh, or friends or, or, or family share with you their own kind of uh, ministry, uh, conceptually, about what they're about, or have noticed something about, about you, or what you're about? Have, or is this all pretty private? Um, that's a, a good question. Certainly many people uh, that I'm good friends with um, have their own ministries mm -hmm. and recognize uh, my ministry. Um, and I share that. I'm in a prayer group. We share uh, how God is present to us during the week. Um, or what God is asking us, or what we think God is asking us to do at the moment. Uh, we share that. Um, I don't um, go into a patient's room and say, Hi, I'm sure a bill do, and I'm a minister from God, like, uh, <laughs> what is that, touched by an angel? Yes, <laughs> I'm an yes, angel. Yes. I, don't, I don't do that. Um, I trust that God's going to work in whatever way He's going to work, and, uh, and that I that I'm there in a whole variety of, of uh, commitments. Uh, there have been some people that were threatened uh, that had knew me forever as an atheist and suddenly, uh, what is this? I remember the first time, uh, mm -hmm. I, see I, I had this conversion experience shortly before Christmas and on Christmas morning I said to my young family after all the presents were open, I went up and got dressed and I thought, now how do I do this? And I, and I said to them, uh, I'm going to church. <laughs> and they said, yes, yeah, sure you are. Yeah, big joke. <laughs> and where are you really going? And I said, I'm going to church. And I wasn't sure enough it took me quite a long time to, to understand what had happened to me. So I couldn't quite explain it to anyone else yet. Um, but I knew I wanted to go to church. And so I went off to church. And at first it was sort of like, um, well, with, with the people that felt this real change in me, oh, this is something, she'll get over it. <laughs> and I just was very quiet, and if people asked me questions, I would answer to the best of my knowledge because I didn't have a clue what had happened to me. I just knew it had happened, and uh, but mo mostly I didn't try to. Uh, I certainly didn't try to suddenly push my family into coming to church with me. I I didn't uh, try mm -hmm. to say. I, I some people thought um, that. I thought I was, quote, better than thou, now oh, that I was going to church. Yeah, and I said, yeah. no, you know, it, it, it's nothing like that at all. Um, I'm not better than I was when I was an atheist. I'm just lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, mm -hmm. I feel um, privileged uh, to know how much God loves me, kind of uh, feeling. But, you know, I wish everyone in the world did because there's such joy involved in it. Uh, that's, it isn't... It isn't so much that I would have everyone in the world know God as I would, because they'd be necessarily better people, but more that they'd be joyful people, that they'd know the, how much they're loved. Uh, and it's um, such an unconditional experience that I would have that for everyone. 
I like the way you describe that, that situation there. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's the best way to put it. Yeah. A related question is, uh, I think I know your answer, but how, how do you witness to your faith with a, with a, a, a child in, in that context, or, or in an other context, doesn't mm -hmm. have to be at work? Um, when do you let people know um, who you are, who, who your Lord is, and, and when do you let your, your, your deeds and your actions suffice? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, it's in interesting that before my conversion, no children ever talked to me about God. Mm. That's an absolute. Really? Um, and I find that fascinating. I must have been putting up huge walls. So that's a, you said no children talked with, with you Adults about sometimes God. It wasn't that, that you didn't talk with them about exactly. God, but the children hadn't exactly. initiated it with you. That's right. And that's, that's exactly what happens, uh, both with adults and with children. Certainly adults had talked to me about their faith, and I had supported them in whatever their faith was. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and because I was born into a church and because I was interested enough in reading, I had a, a wide knowledge of people's faith so that I could do that. But it wasn't until after my conversion that children started telling me about their experience of God. <laughs> and it was just, and it just kept happening and happening and happening. What and kind said, of things would oh, they say? They just, um, wow. Uh, they, would, they would talk about talking to God mm -hmm. um, and that was their prayer but they would talk to God and and I had one little girl who was far from home and her family was unable to visit and she would she would say that when she got really scared at night she would talk to God and God would tell her that she was okay and that he was he was right there and that she could go to sleep and then she would go to sleep How and, old was she? Um, this this uh, girl was nine I had uh, one little girl tell me that um, she uh, that that God was um, very um, that God loved everybody, that God loved everybody, and that God sort of watched you like Santa Claus does. She was a four-year-old, uh, and that. Um, saw when you were good and when you were bad, and, but, but God forgave you. And that's why, she said, even if you were bad, sometimes you got presents anyway at Christmas. So she sort of got them all wound up together. Um, I had uh, one little girl write a letter to God saying, God, um, it is, uh, she had leukemia and, and talking about how difficult it was for her to have leukemia because special things happened to her and it made her special and it made her brothers feel badly. Mm. And um, They were left out. They were left out <clears throat> and, and please God, please get rid of my leukemia. I had one little girl, uh, the same nine-year-old, I was lying in bed reading a story with her and, and uh, she um, it was a Narnia, it's the Narnia. Uh, series, and yeah. I was reading it to her, and she Chronicles stopped me, and she Narnia. said, you know, I think that's just what heaven is like, don't you? And we had this conversation <laughs> about what heaven was like. Um, I had a little girl say to me, do you know what happens when people die, Shira? And she patted the bed, and it wasn't it wasn't like, would you like to sit down? It was sit, <laughs> you know? And so I sat and I said, well, what? And she said, when people die, they go to funeral homes and people there curl their hair and put makeup on them and close their eyes so they look as though they're just asleep. Isn't that silly? <laughs> and, and then she said to me, what do you think happens when people die? And just then someone walked in and interrupted us and she went off to a test and we, we didn't get to finish that conversation. How old was she? She was seven. 
Mm. I've had uh, many conversations with children who were dying that could could talk to me. I Do we have a I call? Think, I think so. No? Five minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, they would talk to me and ask me, you know, um, what did I think? Did I think this? Did I think that? I never, with adults or children, impose it on them. As I had a young man who I said, and I will, I will ask people, um, what's your sense of life after death? What do you believe? And uh, I had a young man who uh, went from believing that maybe, at best, mm -hmm. we became uh, vapor, like mm -hmm. steam, mm -hmm. and changed in that way, to, at his death, talking about the presence that was with him all the time. Mm. And following it around the room, as I would have said, at his deathbed, and he was 23, um, and, and saying, isn't it beautiful? And I said to him, what do you call that presence? And he said, I don't know. And I would just leave it there. I never imposed my own belief system on, on anyone else. I, so often churches uh, across the board, I mean, uh, I, in my experience anyway, <coughs> they, when they talk about Christian education for children, they're trying to... To, to tell children, you know, all kinds of stuff about stoles or church history or mm -hmm. theology mm -hmm. or what the Bible says, mm -hmm. but they don't listen to what the children have to say about mm -hmm. their own relationship mm -hmm. with God, as though the children were, weren't aware of the presence of God. Mm -hmm. and that's, yeah. that's sad. The one, uh, one uh, I know we just have a couple of minutes, but a, a dear story that I love uh, happened to um, a friend of mine and her daughter and uh, a deeply religious family. God is very much part of their everyday life. And this little girl was just seven years old and she woke up with a nightmare. And she was very frightened and her mother, mother went in and took her in her arms and cuddled her and talked to her. And when she calmed down, started to put her back to sleep. And she said, no, mommy, don't leave. And she says, but you know that God is with you right here and that your guardian angel is here and that you don't ever have to be scared. And she said, but Sometimes I just need somebody with skin on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Isn't that wonderful? I Kids love say it. I things love it. beautifully and wonderfully, and it's. I uh, love it. That's very profound. Isn't that wonderful? You're very, very profound. So, so I guess that's how I see myself <coughs> sometimes doing God's ministry as somebody with skin on. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, it's been delightful to have you here. Uh, uh, there are a lot of very profound things you've had to say, as I thought that might happen. <laughs> Perhaps we've had no, no phone calls because uh, people are so wrapped at listening to you that uh, they're not phoning in. Um, well, I hope that, that um, people will spend some time thinking about what their ministry is in the world and, uh, and really spending some time talking to God about it because uh, it'll broaden. And I know you, 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 you believe this way because I, I know you, but that God will also answer. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not just something that you read about in the Hebrew scriptures or in the Christian scriptures, but God will really answer. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. always say what I think he's going to. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he always answers. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well... Uh, in, in the uh, Christian scriptures, Jesus says uh, I, that uh, you'll have no part of us unless we all become as small Little children. children. Mm. I think that's very profound. Mm -hmm. Very profound. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't know God in any other way. That's right. And so, uh, well, I'm grateful for your ministry. Well. I know many, 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 many other people are as well, Sharon. Thank uh, you. It's been a pleasure to be here. If uh, some of you, haven't, if some of you haven't uh, <coughs> decided to phone in, you can still write us a letter, a care of the studio, and we'll be glad to uh, to answer it. So that's an option for you. So <coughs> we look forward to your your tuning in channel 15 next week and uh, and joining us with our next uh, uh, part about personal ministry.